What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Open your Bible, if you will, to the uh, sixth chapter of Mark's Gospel. In the wonderful providence of God, we're working our way through Mark, and we just happen to arrive at this particular portion of Scripture in Mark chapter 6, verses 7 and following, in which our Lord sends out the twelve on their first short-term mission trip. In the sixth chapter of Mark's gospel, we come to a very, very important turning point, transition point, mega shift in the ministry of our Lord's kingdom gospel preaching. This is that text in which He delegates His message and His power for the first time to the twelve apostles and sends them out essentially to preach exactly what He preached and to do exactly what He did. The text can really begin for us at the back half of verse 6, and He was going around the villages teaching, and He summoned the twelve and began to send them out in pairs and gave them authority over the unclean spirits, and He instructed them that they should take nothing for their journey except a mere staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belt, but to wear sandals, and He added, do not put on two tunics. And He said to them, "'Wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave town. And any place that does not receive you or listen to you as you go out from there, shake the dust off the soles of your feet for a testimony against them.'" They went out and preached that men should repent. And they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. At this point, there's an account of the death of John the Baptist. After this account, Mark returns to the sending of the twelve in verse 30 and records their return after their short-term mission. Notice verse 30, the apostles gathered together with Jesus. They are now constituted as the apostles. After this first mission, they become an official group. They reported to Him all that they had done and taught. And He said to them, "'Come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest a while, for there were many people coming and going, and they didn't even have time to eat. They went away in the boat to a secluded place by themselves.'" Here we discover, as I said, a major shift in the ministry of our Lord. Now, I ask a question all the time, sometimes consciously, but certainly all the time un consciously. And that question has become familiarized to us in some rather pop ways, what would Jesus do? But that is a compelling question that resides in my mind at all times. Uh, What would be the Lord's reaction to this situation? What attitude would the Lord bring to bear to this kind of conflict? What strategy would the Lord use here? If the Lord were here, what would He do? If the Lord were here, what would He say? If, uh, If we were to design a model for ministry and we were to ask the Lord how to design it, what would He tell us to do? Uh, He is the one that we want to turn to. Everything He did was perfect. Everything He did was absolutely the best possible strategy, incorporated the absolute pure purposes of God, and we learn the most, of course, from Him and those who followed Him. Uh, We get a lot from Paul who said, follow me because I follow Christ. Uh, It's a compelling passage then to read in the sense that here is Jesus giving us the features and the elements and the formulas for effective ministry. We also are delegates of Christ. While we have some limitations the apostles didn't have, namely the ability to do signs and wonders and miracles, we have the same message and the same responsibility. And so our Lord gives us here a model for delegating spiritual ministry. In a very real sense, this passage here is, uh, is kind of the, the foundation for ministry in the church, the foundation for leadership in the church, how we are to view ourselves as representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I said, this is a singularly crucial transition 
point in His ministry marking a brand new strategy. Up to now, uh, He has been the only preacher, the only preacher. It was Him and His followers. John the Baptist was another preacher. He was a preacher certainly of righteousness. He was a preacher of repentance. He was a preacher of the kingdom of God. It was He who pointed to Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But mark it right here. Mark sandwiches in this count, the execution, the beheading of John the Baptist to mark it out that at this point Jesus is the only preacher. Even John is finished. It's critical at this particular point then, in this last final third sweep over Galilee, only a few months left before He leaves and only a, a, a less than a year of ministry in Judea and He will be crucified, it's critical at this point that Jesus spread the responsibility and the opportunity to make a maximum impact all across Galilee in this final time. By the time you come to chapter 10, verse 1, they have left Galilee. So this is near the end of His Galilean mission. Little time, pressing crowds made this necessary. When I say pressing crowds, I mean tens of thousands of people crushing Jesus so that He couldn't get from here to there, He couldn't barely eat a meal, um, let alone go from town to town and town to town with that kind of crowd crushing Him. So the solution is to diffuse the crowd. And how do you diffuse the crowd? By multiplying the number of preachers and the number of miracle workers. And so for this last third and final sweep through Galilee, that's exactly what He does. And by the way, a footnote here, if you ever are asked what is the definition of leadership, the definition of leadership is getting things done effectively through other people. That's leadership, getting things done effectively through other people. That's exactly what He does here. Up to now, verse 6 says He was going around the villages teaching. Then in verse 7, here in this moment, He summoned the twelve and began to send them out in pairs. This is brand new, the twelve. They're now designated as the twelve by Mark. Later on in verse 30, they will be designated by Him for the first time as the apostles, the twelve apostles. They have already followed Jesus. They had been elevated to permanent believing disciples. They had then been elevated again to apostles. A disciple is a student, an apostle is a sent one, uh, a disciple is a learner, an apostle is a preacher. A disciple is one gathered in for instruction, an apostle is one sent out for proclamation. It's time now for them to go. They've had up, up to 18 months, maybe even more, maybe closer to 20 months of day-to-day, hour-by-hour instruction in what the Lord does and what He says. They've heard His preaching day after day after day, hour after hour after hour, and the message was now clear to them, time for them to go out on their first short-term mission. This is good strategy. This is necessary. This is a model the Lord has established. We understand the value of it. When you've trained men and you are readying them for a life of ministry, you send them out on short-term uh, opportunities so that they can come back and tell the things that were successful, the things that were challenges, so there can be further instruction, further preparation in anticipation of a full and final sending. The full and final sending of the twelve didn't come until after the resurrection, after the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. Then you have the Lord gathering them just before His ascension and saying, go into all the world, preach the gospel to everybody, go everywhere, baptizing them, teaching them to observe whatever I command them. I'm going to be with you to empower you. He reminds them in Acts 1-8, just before ascending, the Holy Spirit will come upon them. They are to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the world. So the final sending is yet ahead. This is their first short-term mission, not far and not long. And as for this mission, as in the final mission, He gives them both the message to preach and He gives them the power to do these miraculous wonders that validate the message. Now remember, they're preaching the kingdom and it is a message that is new and there is a validation that is necessary. There, there were roaming teachers all over everywhere. How do you know who's 
from God. Well, whoever can heal the sick, cast out demons, and raise the dead is from God. Those are the validating signs. Sermons and signs. They were given sermons that Jesus had preached, and they were able to do the signs that Jesus had done. In fact, they could heal the sick. Uh, Luke 9 says they were able to heal the sick in addition to cast out demons, and here uh, in, in verses 12 and 13 it tells us they did that. Matthew 10, 8 says they were told to raise the dead. So they were delegated the same power over disease, over demons, and over death that Jesus had exhibited. This way the, the crowd would be spread, and this way they would have much more freedom to move and this way they would be an exact duplication of what our Lord did. This is, I said, is the start of delegated responsibility in the kingdom which comes all the way down to church leadership and to those of us who are in ministry today. We stand in their progeny, in their continuity, in their chain. Now to remind you that when He chose these twelve men, He was making a statement about the apostasy of Judaism. None of them came from the religious establishment. None of them was a Pharisee, a scribe, a rabbi, a priest. None of them was a temple uh, uh, attendant in any way. None of them had any Levitical responsibility there. No one was a ruler of a synagogue. They were completely outside the religious establishment. Uh, none of them was a teacher. None of them was known as a religious leader in any sense whatsoever. They were an interesting assortment of very, very plain, unimportant men as far as religious activities were concerned. Now Jesus choosing these men is an open judgment and condemnation on the religious establishment. There wasn't anybody in the religious establishment that was worthy of this. The whole system was absolutely apostate. We know that. It is the religious establishment that led the operation that ended up in the execution of the Messiah. Well, the Lord is rendering a judgment on the system of Judaism. Furthermore, there are twelve of them, and that is not by chance, that is not merely a happenstance. There are twelve because there are twelve tribes in Israel, and they are the symbols of the new Israel, the true Israel, the Israel of God, the new people that the Lord is forming. Here is a massive indictment on Judaism at the time of Jesus. Mark it in your minds. Folks, Jesus rejected totally the Judaism of His day. It was not sufficient to bring salvation to anyone, and neither is the Judaism of this day or any other day that rejects the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no way to heaven except through Him. And so He chooses the twelve and renders a judgment on the nation Israel. Now as we look at what's in this text. We find some of the elements in the profile of a faithful messenger, true ambassador, and representative of the Lord Jesus. We, we covered three of them last time. I have a few more for this morning. Number one, I'm just reviewing here, they proclaim salvation. They proclaim salvation. I just want you to lock down on the fact that the message is salvation. Luke 9, 2, parallel passage, Matthew 10, parallel passage, we'll borrow from both of them. In Luke 9, 2 it says, "...and He sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God." He sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God. That can be assumed because if they were sent to represent Him, that's what He proclaimed. If you were to go back to the first chapter, verse 14, 15, 27, 34, 39, and etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you would see that He came preaching the kingdom, preaching the kingdom. And there was one other element to it. He preached repentance. And if you look at verse 12, they went out and preached that men should repent. So the message was, repent of sin. Repent of the sin of your self-righteous religion and come into the kingdom of God through faith in Christ. Matthew 10 says, He sent them to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Mark it, friends, apart from Christ, the people of Israel are lost. The Jewish people are lost. They were lost then. They're still lost. We still go to them to proclaim the only hope, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the message was not obviously complete, but they preached repentance and they preached the kingdom and they preached that Jesus is the Messiah and the only Savior and you must put your faith in Him. Later on, when they were sent finally and permanently, they preached the great glory of the cross and the resurrection. They preached Christ and they preached Him crucified. That becomes our message. I love how this 
starts in the book of Acts. Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2.22, and what's his message? Does he preach about the, uh, the abuses of uh, Roman occupation? Does he uh, preach about the abuses of slavery? Does he preach about the abuses of overtaxation? No. He stands up and says this, "'Men of Israel, listen to the words, these words, Jesus uh, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs which God performed through Him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, they never denied His miracles. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put Him to death. God raised Him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for Him to be held in its power. Preached Christ crucified and Christ risen. Same sermon, verse 36, comes to an end. Let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made Him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Peter repeatedly, as did all the apostles, indicts the Jews for crucifying Christ. That's not debatable. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart, verse 37, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, namely Gentiles, as many as the Lord our God will call to Himself. This is what they preached. They preached Christ. They preached Christ crucified. In chapter 3, Peter stands up again and replies in verse 12, "'Men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or piety we have made Him walk to heal the crippled man in the temple?' And then he goes on, "'The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified His servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release Him. But you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. But put to death the Prince of Life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. And on the basis of faith in His name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know, and the faith which comes through Him has given Him this perfect health in the presence of you all." They preach nothing but Jesus. Chapter 4. Peter, verse 8, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, "'Rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name this man stands here before you in good health, and he is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders and which became the chief cornerstone, and there is salvation in no other name. There is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved." That's apostolic preaching. And it kept going like that chapter after chapter after chapter, and it was always the cross and the resurrection. And that's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, we preach Christ and Him, what? Crucified. Nothing, by the way, has come down from heaven to change the mandate. So we stand in the great line of the apostles, and if we want to be faithful messengers and representatives of Christ, we have only one message, we preach the message of salvation. Secondly, they manifested compassion. They manifested compassion. The Lord delegated them miracle power. Verse 7 says they had authority over the unclean spirits. Uh, Luke 9.1 says, and to heal diseases. And Matthew 10, 8 says, and to raise the dead. They were able to have power over demons, death, and disease just as Jesus did. And as I told the men this week, there were many ways that uh, the, the Lord could have demonstrated divine power, proven that they were true preachers, done miracles in the sky, which is what the Pharisees always wanted, show us a sign in the sky. But instead, He had the miracles which touched people at the point of their great suffering, disease, demons, and death. This is to show that God is a God of mercy and a God of compassion. And while we don't have the miracle power, part of our message is the Lord one day will take you to the glory of His heaven where there's no sickness, no sadness, no death, right? One day, as He says in Matthew 8, He will heal all your infirmities. And in the meantime, He is a God of compassion. The third thing that we learned last time, they live dependently. Those who are Representatives of Jesus Christ live dependently. 
He instructed them they should take nothing for their journey. Go with the clothes on your back, that's it, the shoes on your feet, and off you go. Just take your mere staff, you need a stick, a walking stick for difficult terrain and uh, maybe to fight off any kind of uh, threat. Don't take any extra bread, don't take a bag to put anything in, no money in your belt. They carried money in their belts and He says, don't put any money in your belt, just put your sandals on, don't take an extra tunic, that's the way you go. Um, this is teaching on trust, right? Now you understand that for all the months that they'd been with Him, for all this period of time approaching two years, they never were really very far from His presence. All their needs were met. When they needed food, He created it if it wasn't available. Uh, they, they knew that while they were around Him, they were going to be fine. They had learned that. But what they needed to learn was they were also going to be fine when He was gone. Uh, he, they needed to know that when he, when he ascended back into heaven, they had nothing to fear. And that's why He said in the upper room discourse, uh, what's going to happen when I go away is simply this, you ask anything in My name and My Father will give it to you. We're going to take care of you. They need to learn the lessons of trust. They needed to, to learn what the Sermon on the Mount said, that if He clothes the grass of the field and the lily of the field, He'll clothe you. And if He feeds the birds of the air, He'll feed you. Yeah, this, is a tr this is lessons on trust. This, this is not permanent. It doesn't mean that all of us who are in the ministry need to take a vow of poverty, that we don't need to live our whole lives like this. In fact, Jesus makes that very explicitly clear in the 22nd chapter of Luke in verse 35 when He looks back at this event and says this, "'When I sent you out without any money belt or bag or sandals, you did not lack anything, did you?' And they said, "'No, nothing.'" For however long they were gone, be it weeks or months, they didn't lack anything. They didn't take any food. They didn't take any extra garments. They didn't know where they were going to stay, but the Lord met every need for a place to rest, a place to stay, food to eat, safety, all of that protection. They said, we had nothing lacking whatsoever. He said to them, but now, whoever has a money belt, take it along. A bag, take that. Whoever has no sword, sell one of your coats and get a sword. You're going to need it. I mean, there comes a time when you must be prepared. When you take what all the Lord provides as part of His gifts to you to make you prepared, providence can work before the event as well as during the event. And so this was merely a, a training session when they needed to learn to live dependently. And they did, and they came back and said they didn't lack anything. Oh, if you're going to be a representative of our Lord, you proclaim salvation, you manifest compassion, and you live dependently. You take whatever the Lord provides. Now fourthly, they demonstrate contentment. They demonstrate contentment. These men could heal. These men could raise the dead. These men could deliver people from demonic possession. When you arrive in town and they begin to see this, everybody is going to want to be your host. Now false teachers would travel and they would stay with one family and exhaust the resources of that family and go to the next house. Paul talks about this when he talks about the fact that false teachers go from house to house leading silly women captive, getting whatever favors they want out of this house and going to the next house, the next house, the next house, padding their pockets. You don't even take a belt to put the money in and you go to one house and you stay there. Verse 10, when, when you go, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave town. You're not going to be able to be bought. Remember I told you last time, he told them, don't, don't take gold from people, don't take silver from people, don't even take copper from people. Don't take anything. The potential here for you to be corrupted is massive. Now one of them would have a hard swallow at this point. Do you know which one? Judas. He had manipulated himself into the position where he held the money bag. He figured if all things go bad, at least he's got the money bag when he splits. The idea here is to be content. Never put a price on your ministry. Accept whatever the Lord provides. Don't sell yourself to the highest bidder.